Income tax 2023-2024. Rental property where the first a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our Accounting Rocks product line. If you're not crunching cords using Excel, you're doing it wrong. A must-have product. Because the fact, as everyone knows, of accounting being one of the highest forms of artistic expression means accountants have a requirement, the obligation, a duty, to share the tools necessary to properly channel the creative muse. And the muse, she rarely speaks more clearly than through the beautiful symmetry of spreadsheets. So get the shirt, because the creative muse, she could use a new pair of shoes. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. There's a personal use situation requiring us to divide the expenses between the rental property and personal use. Get ready and some coffee so we can recognize the quacks when doing income tax preparation 2023-2024. Most of this information can be found in Publication 527 Residential Rental Property, including Rental of Vacation Homes Tax Year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. The Schedule E rental property ultimately rolling into line one income of the income tax formula. Noting the first half of the income tax formula is basically a funny income statement where we have income minus, instead of calling them expenses, we call them deductions resulting instead of net income in taxable income. The rental property schedule E, similar to the business property schedule C, is basically an income statement in and of itself, having rental income minus rental expenses, which you can call rental deductions, resulting in, in essence, net rental income, which rolls in from the schedule E to line one income of the formula. This income tax equation outlining the calculation of the form 1040 of which we see the first page income section here schedule e ultimately rolling into line eight additional income from schedule one this is the schedule one additional income and adjustments to income part number one additional income the schedule e rolling into line five rental real estate and so on and so forth from the schedule e we then have the schedule e supplemental income uh, and loss where we have, in essence, an income statement format broken out by property rental income minus the rental expenses. Now, as we go through our cases here, we want to be comparing to the baseline case where we're imagining we have our personal residence possibly, and then another piece of property, which is completely for rental use. And that would be the easiest scenario because we wouldn't have the mix up between business and personal, thinking then of the second property as just basically an income statement related to it, having income from the rental use minus the expenses needed to be consumed in order to generate the revenue, resulting in the net income. Some of those expenses, possibly including the interest on the mortgage, as well as the real estate taxes, which we're now applying to a business or rental use as opposed to our principal residence, in which case those particular deductions might be allowed on, for example, the Schedule A itemized deductions if it was our principal residence, which is unusual because on the personal side of things, we don't usually get deductions unless there was some kind of funny lobbying from interest groups that have happened or politicians trying to buy votes and this and that that has happened, noting that the business side makes more sense. These are expenses that we needed to consume in order to generate the revenue. That's a natural type of deduction for an income tax system. Then we're going to compare that to a situation where things are more muddy, more confusing, more mixed together, and it's difficult to separate because now we have a second piece of property that we have a business and personal use for. 
remember the two scenarios where this is commonly going to occur is if we have our principal residence and we we rent out a part of it uh and and then we have a principal and personal and rental piece or and that was in a prior presentation or we have a second piece of property that we're using possibly partially for a vacation home but not for the entire year and renting it for part of the period so now we have a similar situation though where there's this mixing of business and personal what are we going to do about that noting that the income is usually not the problem because the income that we get from the property will always be for the rental of the property be reported as income the irs wants a piece of it and so on it's the expenses that become a concern because if i paid for things for the property for the entire year i'll have to allocate the expenses in some way you would think between business and personal because the business or rental side possibly could be deductible whereas the personal would not all right personal use of dwelling unit including a vacation home so if you have any personal use of a dwelling unit, including a vacation home that you rent, you must divide your expenses between rental use and personal use. So it's that, you know, it's a rental property. I use it for part of the year, like in the summertime. And in the winter time, there's a polar bear that, that uses it as a vacation home. And therefore I should get to deduct the expenses related to the property and so on so right you get you see where the iris is going to have kind of a problem here because again the iris doesn't like losses they don't like you just being able to write off expenses possibly for a vacation home having losses that you can take against other uh, uh property when it's really obviously a like a personal vacation home so you can see the problems that we have to break out here so in general your rental expenses will be no more than the total expenses multiplied by a fraction the denominator of which is the total number of days the dwelling unit is used and the numerator of which is the total number of days actually rented at a fair rental price now notice this is, becomes important because you're saying okay i've got to break out the expenses i get it what what is the ratio that I'm going to be using. You can imagine multiple different ratios that might, you know, kind of make sense. You could say, well, I'm going to say the number of days it was rented compared to the number of days in the year, or maybe the number of, of days that I used it for personal uh, use rather than vacation use divided by the number of the days of the year are the amount that's not going to be included, right? Or something like that. So this fraction, what do we have here? the denominator of which is the total number of days the dwelling unit is used. So the total number of days the dwelling unit is used. So, so that's including the rental and personal use of the dwelling units, but it also leaves an indication that there might be some part of the year where it's not in use. And, and so that's gonna be an important number that we're gonna have to break out and make sure what the denominator of the fraction is and the numerator of which is the total number of days actually rented. So actually rented being a key term here as well, which we're gonna have to make sure that we get that part down because it's gonna have a big impact on the amount of expenses we might be able to deduct. Only your rental expenses may be deducted on the Schedule E Form 1040. Some uh, of your personal expenses may be deductible uh, on Schedule A Form 1040 if you itemize your deductions. Similar situation. If it was your principal residence, then you, you might be able to deduct some on the Schedule A for the mortgage interest and the real estate taxes. You also have like a second home situation where that might you know be the case so if it qualifies then you might be able to break out those particular expenses between the rental e use and the schedule a use you can't of course double dip and deduct them on both items we can only take the schedule a items if we qualify and if our schedule a deductions are greater than in essence the standard deduction as is the general rule with other expenses like depreciation for example and other kind of repairs and maintenance on the home you would think we would not be able to deduct the personal side of them uh, because you don't get to deduct those things generally on a schedule a for example but might be able to deduct the business side of them 
on the schedule E. So you must also determine if the dwelling unit is considered a home. So the amount of rental expenses that you can deduct may be limited if the dwelling unit is considered a home. So whether a dwelling unit is considered a home depends on how many days during the year, uh, year are considered to be days of personal use. So now we have this definition, do we consider it as a home or not, which again could have an impact on the rental calculations as well as the, the consideration as to whether the personal side could be deductible right, on possibly a Schedule uh, A situation. So there's a special rule if you use the dwelling unit as a home and you rented it for less than 15 days during the year. All right, so dwelling unit. A dwelling unit includes a house, apartment, condominium, mobile home, boat, vacation home, or similar property. It also includes all structures or other property belonging to the dwelling unit. A dwelling unit has a basic living accommodations such as sleeping space, a toilet, and cooking facilities. So obviously, if you're thinking about it as a rental property, you can imagine all kinds of different property and, and so on and so forth, but you would think these basic items would be there, whether it be a normal house or some kind of trailer or a boat or something, you would think it would have some place to sleep, some toilet area, and some place to cook stuff. Those are the basic things you kind of need for dwelling in a unit and therefore part of the definition of a dwelling unit. So a dwelling unit doesn't include property or part of the property used solely as a hotel, motel, inn, or similar establishment. So you might say, what's the difference between the hotel, motel, and inn? And remember that we got back to some of the prior presentations as to whether we should be reporting these items on as like rental property, which might be more passive in nature versus a service kind of item which is typically more active in nature if you're talking about a motel or an an inn or something you're providing services to people more often cleaning the place and keeping it up maybe making breakfasts and having to have multiple tenants coming in all the time whereas if it's simply a rental property you're typically looking at a more passive type of of situation you're collecting the rent doing certain maintenance and so on when needed but not typically on a day-to-day -day basis you're not in there making the beds or having someone or hiring someone right so property is used solely as a hotel motel inn or similar establishment if it is uh, regularly available for occupancy by paying cu customers and isn't used by a owner as a home during the year example you rent a room in your home that is always available short-term occupancy by paying customers. So you've got, you're not a hotel, but you got this room that you're renting out from time to time because you're by the beach or something and people like to like hang out there and you get a little bit of extra income to support your lifestyle, you know? So that's everybody wins, it's a win-win. So you don't use the room yourself uh, and you, I don't sleep in there, there's crazy people that sometimes or you know rent the room out to be honest so i kind of clean it up and then stay out of it uh you don't use the room yourself and you allow only paying customers to use the room so this room is used solely as a hotel motel inn or similar establishment and isn't a dwelling unit in that case dividing expenses so if you use the dwelling unit for both rental and personal purposes divide your expenses between the rental use and the personal use based on the number of days used for each purpose so clearly we have the concept now that we have to then somehow break out the expenses between business and personal and then of course it comes down to the nitty-gritty how exactly do we do that what's the ratio we're going to use and we use that the number of days used for each so when dividing your expenses follow these rules so any day that the unit is rented at a fair rental price is a day of rental use even if you use the unit for personal purposes that day so if you're renting it out for that day even if you were using part of it because you were hanging out there with whoever you're renting it to or something i don't know but they paid you for the rental day so you would think if it was an arm's length transaction that would qualify as a rental day so this rule doesn't apply when determining whether you use the unit as a home that's a different rule so any day the unit is available so 
okay so any day the unit uh, the unit is available for rent but not actually rented uh, isn't a day of rental use now that's a more restrictive term right because now and remember when when we didn't use the home for personal use we had the idea that well what if i was trying to rent it i was advertising for it and whatnot i just it was just vacant at that time if it wasn't used for rental purposes it might be more likely that time could qualify possibly as you know rental because it's a rental property but they're being a lot more restrictive here if it's a vacation home then now they're saying it has to be a day that's actually be it's actually being rented right not like it's like vacant so any day that the unit is available for rent but not actually rented isn't a day of rental use fair rental price now this is also a problem because when you, when you have these cool vacation homes one of the cool things to do with them is to basically uh, rent them out or let family and friends use them at something other than the fair rental price which messes up the whole thing because from the irs's perspective they're saying hey we're your silent partner over here you're trying to rent things out to make money so that we can take part of it and if you give it away at something lower than the fair rental price then you might end up with a loss possibly being able to take that against any other income and the irs isn't cool with that you know because they want they want revenue out of this out of this thing so you can see the problem here if you start renting it for something other than the fair rental price so a fair rental price for your property is uh, generally the amount of rent that a person who isn't related to you would be willing to pay. In other words, an arm's length transaction, not your family members, not your friends. You're trying to actually make money. What would they pay for the property in a fair use situation? So the rent you, you charge isn't a fair rental price if it is substantially less than the rents charged for other properties that are similar to your property in your area. You can imagine this happening in an audit where the IRS is saying, hey, look, you, you have a loss in the property and so on and so forth. We're auditing you because we don't think that you're charging the fair market price. You're renting it out for something less than that, possibly because you're giving it to your friends or your family. And then you're trying to take a loss against us when we're trying to take some of your revenue money. And so we don't like that. And so then, so then you'd have to say no you'd have to then you would think give some evidence like that it was rented at a fair market price how would you do that you can look at similar properties in the area that's how they might ask or check or double check ask yourself the following questions when comparing another uh, property with yours so is it used for the same purpose so now we're trying to basically appraise the value in terms of what the rental property would be which is difficult as difficult or similar to appraising the sales price of a, a property because property is unique in nature right so we're going to have to do our best bet to come up with like some kind of appraisal is it approximately the same size is it approximately the same conduct so you might say hey look that place across the street is renting for like for like less than what i rent it for and the, and the irs auditor is going to say yeah but that place is as big as a closet it's basically an outhouse and you've got a mansion over here you can't do a comparison with like an outhouse just because it's in the same it's got to be comp you need like a comparable property so does it have similar furnishing so is it uh so uh is it in a similar location of course so if any of the answers are no the properties probably aren't similar right so example let's look at one your beach cottage was available for rent from june 1st through august 31 92 days i love that beach cottage man i hang out there except for the for the first week in august seven days when you were unable to find a renter you rented the cottage at a fair rental price during that time okay so the person who rented the cottage for july allowed you to use it over over the weekend uh, two days without any reduction in the refund uh, or refund of rent your family also used the cottage during the two weeks of may uh, 14 days the cottage wasn't used at all before may 17th or after august 31st all right this is getting complicated you figure the apart the part of the cottage expenses to treat as rental expenses as follows so the college was used the cottage 
was used uh, for rental a total of 85 days. That was the 92 days minus the seven days when it wasn't actually rented. The days it was available for rent, but not rented, there were seven days. So the seven days it was available for rent, but it wasn't actually rented, therefore the rental days are 85. So aren't days of rental use. So the July weekend, two days, you used it, uh, used it is rental use because you received a fair price. So in other words, you actually used it during those two days that it was rented, but you still charged them the rental price. And you would think that then, then if you charged them the rental price, it was rental property of those two days, even though you used it. You used the cottage for personal purposes for 14 days, the last two weeks in May. So the total use of the cottage was 99 days, 14 days personal plus 85 days of rental use. So your, your rental expenses are the 85 days on the rental use divided not by 365, the number of days in the year, but by the total days that have been used, personal and rental. So it's not divided by all the days in the year, right? So we're not getting up to 365. We've got the rental and personal. So that comes out to 86% of the cottage expenses. Note, when determining whether you use the cottage as a home, which is another test that we might come to for other purposes. So the July weekend, two days you used it is considered personal use, even though you received a fair rental price for the weekend. Therefore, so you had 16 days of personal use and 83 days of rental use for uh, this purpose because you use the cottage for personal purposes more than 14 days and more than 10 percent of the days of rental use uh, eight days you used it as a home so if you have uh, a net loss you may not be allowed uh, to de deduct all the rental expenses so now it's categorized as a home and remember the iris is skeptical of a loss situation and so that's usually when it comes into play. If, you, if it's still income, the IRS is like, cool, we'll take part of that. If it's a loss, the IRS is like, hold up, hold up, something ain't right here. And then, you know, you might have some. So for that, you could see dwelling unit used as a home.